Hi, my name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri, and this show is called Insight. Uh, Insight is a show where we discuss books on politics uh, domestically and internationally. Sometimes historical books provide some insight into the present and sometimes broader atmospheric or trend analysis books that put some political issues into a broader setting. Uh, today's book is uh, domestically. It's about uh, people who carry concealed weapons. It's written by Jennifer Carlson, and the title of her book is called Citizen Protectors, The Everyday Politics of Guns in an Age of Decline. Now, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Tanya Contreras, to Tanya's right is Jonah Mead Van Court, and to Jonah's right is Daniel Gilmore. Now, I wanted to read a brief uh, segment of the book so you can get a sense of where the author's coming from, and then we'll jump into a discussion of the book. She writes, since the 1970s, more than three dozen states have significantly loosened their restrictions on Americans' ability to carry guns legally. The increased popularity of gun carry reflects changes in why Americans say they want guns in the first place. One survey shows that Americans are much more likely to own and carry guns for protection today than they were in 1996. Gun owners and carriers are overwhelmingly men. In Michigan, men are four times more likely than women to have a permit to carry a gun. The racial breakdown of gun carriers in Michigan may also surprise some. White and black residents are equally likely to have a permit. In fact, African Americans have higher rates of concealed carry and licensees per capita than white residents. I really like how this book starts off because it almost doesn't even start off as a research paper. It starts off a lot more as a narrative. She talks about a storekeeper who um, had to shoot down um, a young man who was trying to rob him and immediately jumps into the issue that she's going to talk about within the book. She says that the man who shot this kid had a gun because he felt that in Flint, Michigan, there really weren't enough police around to keep a protective shop around. And so it really immediately dives into um, what the main issue is, which is why people, men in particular, are so adamant about having guns. And she has a really good way of describing this through different stories. I, uh, my favorite part of this book was how it broke down my original opinion about how gun culture exists in, in the United States. I used to think that gun culture was a monolithic idea and I, after reading this book I realized that that isn't true. There's, there's frontier gun culture there's uh, traditional gun culture, there's uh, the gun culture that's most talked about in this book where the economics get poor and the police get scarce and then you need to protect yourself. So I thought that, that was, for me that was the best, uh, most informational part of this book. Yeah, this book opened my eyes to the different reasons why a person would own a gun. Usually in America when we think of gun owners we think of like tea parties and Confederate flag waivers, but in this case it was Detroit is, is extremely dangerous and white or black, I'm just legitimately trying to protect myself. It's not just NRA propaganda here. Well, um, in fact, I think she's, I found the book sort of interesting. She's basing it on about 60 interviews. She herself gets a concealed carry permit and becomes an NRA licensed instructor. That part of the book was a little uh, shady. I didn't quite understand how she went from never having a gun to getting a concealed carry. I understood that. She's only talking about a one-day course, but then suddenly she became a licensed 
uh, NRA instructor. So uh, I thought, well, maybe to become an instructor as opposed to getting a license to carry, there should be a greater degree of training. And I didn't really see that go in uh, to any detail in the book. Well, I actually thought that that was the most interesting part of the book because when you do research on the author, she's actually a psychology. Uh, she has a degree in psychology and she studies uh, psychology of carrying an arm. And so I feel like in order to study why people own a gun, it's very interesting that in her research she would want to become a person who owns a gun. And I think becoming licensed as an NRA instructor just kind of takes it that extra step. It's about getting yourself into the sort of mindset, not simply just studying people who are gun owners, but becoming a gun owner yourself and seeing if perhaps the way that you view gun ownership changes because of it. So I found that very interesting, especially because she is a woman. As she says herself, women are less likely to own a gun. And so her being a woman and getting a gun and going into great strengths to you know, understand the psyche of a gun owner, I thought was the most interesting thing. So yeah, I found it interesting too. But for me, it was sort of a reaffirming idea that in America, we don't have the proper training system for the people, for, first for the people owning guns, for the people training people to own guns. It, I'm not, I'm not for prohibition. I think it just makes the problem go underground. But I am for training. I am for, for with guns. I am for a bureaucratic nightmare in order to make it harder. So if you want a gun, you have to really want it. You have to really earn it. Just like you want, if you want to own a car, you have to go through six months of training. You need to do tests. You need to have hours logged. I, you need to. Be, do a driving test, um, and uh, I, I don't see that with guns. So I, I, I saw her how easily she became a from a, just a psychologist to a gun uh, NRA instructor. Reiterated how easy it was to get a gun in America. I assume that her becoming an NRA instructor, there was probably a long stretch in time that she just didn't mention, and that's and she had to presumably pass a lot of tests in order to become one and that she just felt that the audience wouldn't be interested in hearing about that. Of course, there's also the possibility that her story is fabricated and that she really wasn't an NRA instructor, but like I'll, give her, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I wouldn't say it would be fabricated. She wouldn't have been putting that in the book. That would have been verified. Uh, I, I thought uh, she obviously wanted to become concealed carry because it helped her in her interview. She talks about the fact that the men she's talking to uh, seem to open up more and are more willing to talk with her knowing that they're going, she's going through the same training sh that they're going through, which is only a one-day course. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're talking about that a lot of it isn't necessarily shooting. Uh, that it's sort of sitting down and talking about uh, why do you want to carry a gun and when are you going to use it and what's a threat situation and how do you think about a threat. And so she thought that was quite surprising how she went through some of that. And what's interesting too is that a lot of the people aren't simply just seeing themselves as citizen protectors as she calls them. They don't only think that they, you know, can protect other people, they think that they should protect other people. They take that en extra incentive from simply protecting themselves to protecting their families and to protecting their communities. And she kind of ties it back to a loss of masculinity within America. She talks about how the breadwinner system has changed over to where back in the 1960s, majority of men were single household, were single household incomes. They were the only ones making an income. They were the ones providing for their families. But now the family dynamic has changed quite a bit with responsibilities being split more evenly and in some cases a lot of women taking more responsibility than the men. And so yeah. gun ownership as a civic duty to protect not only yourself but those around you sort of perpetuates this masculinity that has been lost within a lot of American men. Yeah, that part I found odd. I don't know. Yeah. The idea of sort of assuming that the reason you want a gun is to somehow uh, reinforce your masculinity rather. But then yeah. I'm thinking, I don't know why she, well, she probably made it part because she is a psychologist. Is it, but yeah. my feeling was like the subtitle of the book, Guns in an Age of Decline, well, talking about the need for the gun in a city like Detroit, which she's saying you're having a shrinking police force and they're not everywhere and so you feel like you have to protect yourself. So the environment 
uh, creates a need to feel like you need a gun uh, would have been a better argument just to keep reinforcing that. Yeah, so I, when I was think, reading this, I, I sort of had a similar reaction as you did. I was thinking, personally, I don't want the justification of carrying an assault weapon, uh, a, a, a weapon that can kill someone, is it makes me feel better, it makes me feel masculine. I want, I, I want to be shown that it makes a society safer. Even if, the, like, I, I know that the main point is when the society is getting unsafe, you want to get more guns in order to, to give it and give it to people that are still invested in making society more safe. But I don't, I, I don't see wanting to feel masculine as a reason or, or a means to an end to making society more safe. Well, what I would say to that, what you were talking about just a second ago, how it would be much more effective for her to argue that economic needs are kind of the reason why people get guns mm. instead of arguing, you know, it's because of a masculinity issue. She does kind of argue that first issue within the first chapter. Mm. She kind of goes into it. I think when she's starts talking about masculinity, she's trying to see the view from a different sort of aspect. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, she does mention that her own personal theory is that it has to do with masculinity. Mm -hmm. And you also have to keep in mind, it's, the perspect it's from a perspective of a woman you know, who studies psychology. So it's going to be different than perhaps uh, you know, a res um, not a researcher, she's obviously a researcher, but perhaps somebody who's more invested in policy making or somebody who is an economist. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why you get that different perspective. When I was reading it, I got the sense that it wouldn't be so much for masculinity, but more of like economic compensation, more like, well, I don't have a decent job anymore, but I do have a gun. I, I feel that that's not so much masculinity as it is compensating for your own lack of money but I also feel that she should separate the different sections of the country like people may legitimately carry guns to be masculine in say Mississippi or Alabama but in Michigan where the book is set people are legitimately fearing for their lives on the streets so I think she should separate different sections of the country. And I thought that was uh, something, yeah, because her focus is Michigan that it's not necessarily the same everywhere uh, she's talking about how Detroit has changed uh, as the auto industry goes away, essentially. Uh, she's talking about an increase in crime rate. She's talking about a slowdown in police responsiveness because there's a decline in police forces or that in some areas the police are just not that interested in wanting to respond. And she, so she at points in the book, she's not making the police look good. In fact, she does cite a police chief who sort of says that it's okay for citizens to sort of complement or supplement police work by having their own concealed weapons, and she refers to him in the book this way. Uh, I, um, one uh, problem that I had with uh, the, the, the argument of this book was that I would call this reasoning by example and sample bias. I, 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 I seemed to see more stories that kind of followed the narrative of like a superhero story of when something really worked. One, one uh, goal of the, the, the NRA, like for instance, open carry, when the cop pulled that uh, man over and searched him but realized that he wasn't a criminal and he got to like show that he was that they break the narrative of um, mo the, the African Americans are if they're holding a gun it's not for legal purposes or the the one about the first store with the shop owner when he, when they when the, he woke up he looked up to see a gun barrel in his face and he was able to shoot the other person before he was shot himself which it wouldn't have happened because it was a fake gun which was mentions at the end but um, not his fault. Uh, but I, I would have liked to see um, statistics and more stories that of when it goes wrong. Like this story about when the toddler gets hold of the gun and shoots the NRA person, or the story about when um, someone when there, when someone just is like when there is a mass shooting, someone tries to shoot back, and the people are caught in crossfire. I want I want I wanted to hear stories about that just to even out how this reality can go down. Well, I think she's trying to do some of that. She has one section in the book where somebody who uh, lives in an environment where they feel threatened suddenly become the threat. Uh, 
-hmm. and that this guy seemed to misread it because he had a confrontation with a woman in a convenience store and then he's, she, he sees her approaching the car where her kids are, his kids are in the car and what he does is pulls out his gun. I was thinking, I've had confrontations with people in different places. I can't imagine that uh, I needed to think, and the first thing I would do would be, to, if I had a gun, to pull it out. I was able to sort of just have a little bit of an argument with somebody, and we both went our separate ways. So somehow that this guy went from zero to 100 in the level of his anxiety, and then he loses his right to carry because of the fact that he pointed a gun but at someone. That goes to sorry, that goes to my back really quick. That goes back to my point. The 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 books the, this book the, the worst example of it going wrong was a guy un, unrightfully pulling his gun out and no one got hurt and he and, and he didn't see he wasn't put in jail forever. It wasn't it, it, like it wasn't that bad of a story. It was almost. It, it like was a false contrast. It 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 used a really like whitewashed story to show how it went, went bad, and then it gave superhero stories that should show when it went good to give the false narrative that this usually goes well. Well, I th I think you're kind of just looking for confirmation bias in a book that's not arguing pro gun or anti gun. It's simply trying to illustrate why somebody who is a gun owner may want to be an owner. It's not meant to be. Uh, so much a political issue, but more of a psychological analysis of the people who Which do Which is all why things. she's yeah. trying to give a sense of explaining um, a culture, why the sort of the mindset of right. certain people with guns. Um, and I think your concept of, you know, that wait a minute, there's different parts of the country and therefore we have to look at it differently. And so people having one in inner city Detroit because of deteriorating situations is not going to be the same as somebody saying, well, I need a concealed weapon in an area where there's barely ever any crime. Right. Yeah, and I was going to say, one of the stories that I do think that I found most memorable of something that did go wrong was the story of Asian Sweet, who was a mm. black man who moved into a Detroit neighborhood all the way back in 1925, and a lynch mob showed up at his house, and he had to shoot someone to protect himself, and then he got put on trial. I was going to say that that certainly was a story of a shooting gone wrong that stuck with you. And that one led to the idea of registering guns because of that incident in uh, Michigan and the police that came to the house said, no, no, there wasn't any problems outside. You, you made it all up. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the cops then in 1925 were completely on the side of the people outside, so they didn't would have agreed with the notion that somebody that was black shouldn't have been moving into a white neighborhood. Um, and so that, again, she's trying to show sort of uh, the environment. Right, and the environment will have an, a huge impact on how people live. And actually what I found interesting was, and you read it um, in the beginning of the episode, is that there's actually no real divide between the populations of Caucasians and African Americans who buy guns. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because the economic distress within people who live in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. is the same, regardless of what color you are. Yes, there's probably more discrimination going against the African American population, but if you are poor and you are living within the bad neighborhoods of Flint, Michigan, I feel like at that point it's not so much a racial issue as much as it is an economic issue. I, Hence why you don't see those differences. I thought in one number. of the interesting things is since you have to take this one day course and it's only mm -hmm. one day to right. get your concealed carry license, she's referring to NRA instructors that saying, well, this, you didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just one day, so you're getting there, but you've got to think of it as what sort of training are you going to continue to do on your own, and then you have to wonder how many of these mm -hmm. people actually, yeah. and, and how could they prepare for it. And talking about the NRA, um, something you haven't hit on yet but is on the list is the difference between a may carry and a shall, yeah. shall carry, shall carry. Um, sort of policy. Um, basically, a uh, may carry policy is what we used to have which the NRA later changed, which basically meant that if you met the basic uh, conditions for owning a weapon, which was not having a record, being over the age of 21, and passing a background check, you were then supposed to be evaluated by a police officer or somebody in charge. And it was under their discretion they whether they you. should give you a gun or not. And shall carry, uh, shall carry more just means, open. Yeah, yeah, shall carry just means there's no discretion. They, they also refer to in the book, she talks about the idea that the NRA was absolutely opposed to the concept of open carry. That they like concealed carry, but uh, 
that was something that they had to then, uh, after the fact, when they saw people uh, that supported the NRA were in favor of it, then moved in that direction of supporting. I want, back to what you were saying about um, just like the NRA policy, I, I, uh, I, I'm curious to think what would be more of a deterrent factor? Would, would it be open carry or concealed carry? Because open carry is people, where people see you have a gun and they don't want to get in the confrontation, but concealed carry is, a, is more, I guess, uh, appealing to the everyday people cause, because they don't want to see a bunch of uh, other um, citizens walking around with guns on their hips. So I, I, I'm curious to know what would be more of a, 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 a deterrent factor. I mean, I can tell you my personal deterrent factor. I mean, I'm okay with a person having a gun if it's holstered to them. Mm -hmm. You don't really get terrified when a police officer pulls you over for a speeding ticket mm -hmm. and has a gun in their pocket because you kind of expect it. If mm -hmm. it became normalized amongst everyday people, then it would be fine. The issue is that we don't see it as a normal thing. And when you do see it as a normal thing, when you go to Southwest Missouri, mm -hmm. where I live, almost everybody carries open sometimes. Or if you go to Texas, and over there it's normalized. But when you live in an area where that's not so common, mm -hmm. then yes, you're gonna become sort of uneasy about it. So it all kind of just depends from perspective. And from my perspective, it's okay. Do you think it makes a place safer? I think that's more of a personal question, but if you were looking for statistics, you'd have to give me years to research that. So, you, so people like literally just like walk around with shotguns in their hands? Depends down. where you go. That's not cool. in their hands. It's holstered. You can see it. The difference is whether you can see it or not. Oh, okay. And what I'm arguing is, is if you grow up in a place where it's very common to see people carrying holstered guns, then that becomes normal to you. If you don't, then that becomes unnormal to you. I so when you see it, you're much more affected by it than if you grow up with it. I was thinking it was like the Black Panthers in the 60s who would like patrol neighborhoods with shotguns in their, uh, in their arms and then uh, Governor Reagan signed the Mulford Act, which the NRA supported, which forbade open carry simply because African-American people were carrying guns. But they were also carrying it while they were in formation and with very um, yeah, but it's different just, intentions. It's just the NRA supported it, which is an interesting... Well, I don't know if they were carrying for different intentions. They were carrying for the same intentions. Their idea was that they were saying they were protecting a black neighborhood. So they weren't saying they were there to intimidate people. They were saying... They were there because of exactly the same reason. You have the whole section in the book on African Americans carrying guns, and when you're when she's interviewing these people, and none of them is about intimidation. It's all about they're trying to protect their neighborhood, which is what they're saying their civic duty is as citizen protector. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's sort of referring and saying, but the problem is is that she says, if you're white with a, a gun, whether concealed or open, and you're black with a gun, concealed or open, the police are gonna be approaching you differently. And she goes through a lot of that. Which actually, the second story that she talks about is about a young gentleman uh, who is African American, who is pulled over by the police, and they confiscate his gun, and as soon as they realize that it was legally registered, they give it back to him. And it was such a big deal to the people in the area that they, they actually cheered for him yeah. from the bus, which, yes, there definitely is a racial issue when it comes to how the police treat um, you know, people of different color. Nobody's going to deny that it exists. Um, but I think really the focus there should be to change how our police policies affect minorities. Instead of trying to focus around guns, we should be focusing on how, for, and not issue particularly, how the police force in general treats people of minority, not how guns are distributed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a gun issue. I think that's a police discriminatory issue. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to that story earlier about the man that was shooting out of his house and then the police came in and said they didn't know where a gun. That didn't seem to me like a problem with guns. That wasn't a story about where guns go wrong. It was about how police discrimination is prevalent. That's what I took away from that story. I didn't see that as a argument against guns. I saw that as an argument for like police uh, reformation. Mm. Yeah, that story kind of increased my previously held view that in, for the most part gun control laws would be pretty racist and would in a way disenfranchise minorities from owning guns. So. Well see this is actually where I think the shall carry gun is actually more helpful to the minority community to obtain guns and 
you know, have that sense of self-protection though, because with the May carry policy, which we used to have, you know, it was much more easy for the people who were distributing guns to discriminate against people yeah. because you had to get that maybe. Like, you may get this, but it's at the dis discretion of the people yeah. distributing like that. Like, you had to persuade them right. the license, license or why if, you needed it. And if mm -hmm. the person happened to be racist or discriminatory because you were a woman or because of X, Y, and Z, then you were less likely to get mm -hmm. it. I think that these new policies actually sort of, from a certain perspective, uh, decrease discrimination, at least in terms of... Do, do we? I have a question. Do you, do you think that we need to make society safer, in, or if society was safer, do you think that we would still need guns? If if we had enough police pre presence to pre and they weren't discriminatory and they were able to protect the citizens, do you think that so that guns are, have a place in a peaceful society? See, that goes into the Mayberry argument, which she talks about, where she's interviewing this old gentleman and he says, "Well, if this was Mayberry, we wouldn't need guns to begin with." But do you agree? It, that's a hypothetical question, which has no place in this well, sort of see, scenario. Well, see, I think though it probably does, because my guess is where you live, there isn't the level of crime that is in Just Detroit. True. But then you're saying people visibly carry guns, so you, you're living in Mayberry in, right, in many true. ways. And so but they have despite guns. it, but they have guns so, despite living in Mayberry. We only have a few minutes left, so let's go through what you think of the book and whether people should read it. Personally, I really like it. It gives you a sort of counterintuitive perspective, analyzing something that's commonly associated with men from a sort of a woman's psychological perspective. And it was very interesting. It's very narrative-based. Um, and despite what other people might think, it's, I actually think it's very unbiased. Like, yes, it's more, it doesn't necessarily go pro-gun or anti-gun. It's literally more analyzing the psychological um, behaviors of people who are pro-gun. Mm. Uh, I thought it was a lot of reasoning and proof by example. I didn't think. I think. It, I think it was biased. I. I, th I do appreciate the anecdotes, but I just want to say real quickly that I, I don't. I don't want a citizen protector. I don't feel safer with someone around me with a gun. I've, if I'm in a shooting, I don't want a trigger happy NRA person pull out their gun and start pull and start firing back at who they think is the assailant, I think I'm, I feel less safe in that situation. I, I don't want, I don't, I do not want a citizen protector to protect me. Uh, I did feel that the book was pretty unbiased in a lot of ways. I thought it did a good job to examine why a person would want a gun and, uh, and you know, as with Michigan, it showed that in some ways it was necessary and I, I enjoyed how it talked about how like the economic decline of Detroit had affected the city and it made a person certainly sympathize with the gun owners even if you disagree with their decision to own a gun. I, I, I wouldn't use the word bias. I'm, uh, that's one of those cute little things that gets thrown around particularly on Fox News. Uh, she's simply trying to prevent, uh, present a way of saying here's this gun culture and how do people that exist in it how do they see themselves? And that basically was all she was trying to say. I would have liked to have known how long it took her to get an NRA licensed instructor status, um, maybe to go into what uh, she would be adding to the training program beforehand because she's saying NRA instructors say it's too short. So it's a good book to read. Uh, presents uh, taking a look at gun culture in a different perspective. Uh, thank you for joining us.